Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Cattle Facts Trends Plus Cow-Calf Webinar um, to start off 2021. Uh, we thank everyone for taking some time to be with us here this evening. We think that we've prepared a pretty good lineup, um, some really good information here this evening. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and dive on in. Um, but first, we would like to extend a big thank you to Lanco Animal Health um, for continuing to be a sponsor um, of this webinar series. Um, they've sponsored it for a number of years and really appreciate their sponsor sponsorship to allow this um, webinar to be free um, to all cow-calf producers. As far as the preview for what we're going to be discussing this evening, um, we'll begin the discussion uh, talking about the grain complex, uh, feedstuffs, and drought. Um, obviously, some big movers here in the market and you know, something that's the top of mind for many people. Um, then we'll touch on where we're at in terms of the liquidation uh, in, this, in this cattle cycle and take a look at what that means to the market fundamentals, both uh, in the near term and as we look out towards the next couple of years. Um, and then we'll go ahead and roll that into looking more specifically at our outlook for the 2021 market um, for calves, feeder cattle, and fed cattle markets. Um, we'll spend a good deal of time um, taking a closer look at the global protein landscape, uh, take looking around the globe, and then dialing that in, in terms of what it means to U.S. beef exports um, and beef trade as we look towards, uh, towards the future. And then lastly, a uh, representative of Lanco Animal Health, uh, Dr. Brett Terhar, um, will be walking us through um, some of their vaccine lineups. Um, we do have a question. We will try to save some time here at the end for some questions. Um, so please enter those into the, uh, into the chat box or the question box and we'll spend some time uh, going over those at the end. I'm Patrick Linnell, an analyst here at Cattlefax, and I'll be walking you through the first portion of uh, this evening's agenda. So first, taking a look at the feed grains, um, the feed grains complex, you know, obviously corn has been a big mover here in the last um, couple months, uh, as we've seen exports um, surged quite a bit higher compared to expectation and where they'd been the last couple of years. Um, and then I've also seen some adjustments in terms of bringing down the, the production numbers um, and bringing down the beginning stocks as well. And so as a result, corn has moved pretty sharply higher um, as we've brought stocks to use um, from that a very comfortable 20 plus percent um, you know, with the initial estimates for the crop. Um, now down to around that 10% level. So as we look at that stocks to use estimate um, along the bottom hand of this axis, uh, compared to price along the left hand side, you can see where we've spent the bulk of the last several years um, above that 12 to 13% stocks to use area um, that's tended to equate with corn in a 325 to 425 market um, when you're looking at spot corn futures. And now, you know, with the stocks to use being brought back um, to around 10%, you know, would suggest that corn should be pretty well supported um, north of that $5 mark, as long as that stocks to use measurement is down around uh, that 10 to 11% mark, um, as the market simply has to ration some demand uh, to ensure that there is, you know, some corn supply available. And then not to mention, you know, as we look here over the next several months, um, Corn will have to continue to compete with soybeans, um, which have also moved sharply higher, to continue to ensure, uh, to continue to buy acres you know, as the farmer makes planting decisions. Uh, soybeans here in front of you today, obviously, also one that's moved pretty dramatically. Uh, stocks to use down you know, around a 3% level, the tightest that it's been um, in quite a few years. And towards certainly towards the lower end of the historical range, and so clearly prices have responded as well. Uh, the bulk of this being driven by increased exports, and something that really most likely won't be changing any time in the near term, um, primarily driven by Chinese demand as they continue to uh, try to rebuild their swine herd. Um, yeah, after um, after the losses from African swine fever. 
um, and move to a more commercialized production setting. And on top of that, you look around the globe, the drought situation in South America continues to limit their ability um, to produce grain. And so, you know, it leaves the U.S. You know, as a primary target um, for Chinese you know, looking to fulfill their grain buy. So certainly expect that you know, it will take some time uh, to recover the soybean uh, supplies you know, with, from these type of you know, tight levels. In terms of wheat, also, um, you know, another one, stocks to use has also moved lower, tightening supplies, and prices have responded and moved higher. You know, now around, you know, well into that, well above that $6 mark here today. So as we bring that back, you know, taking taking a look at hay prices, as you see here in front of you, hay does tend to move with these other feedstuffs, um, often with a lagging effect to some degree um, from a competing feedstuff standpoint. But then also, you know, clearly the drought situation that can affect uh, that affects these other feedstuffs also limits hay production as well. And so with these dry conditions in many parts of the country. Um, will continue to be a factor that should support um, higher hay prices um, as we look on down the road. And not to mention that USDA estimated that hay stocks were tighter um, as we started the year. And again, speaking of drought, uh, you can see that, you know, clearly plenty of paint on the drought monitor, you know, especially as you look towards the southwestern portion of the country um, in some pretty exceptional drought levels yeah, and working its way out towards the West Coast, um, as well as up into the North Plains um, and into Western and Central Texas there as well. Um, so pretty, pretty uh, you know, obviously pretty significant conditions yeah, in terms of the drought throughout the bulk of cattle, throughout a lot of cattle country. And as we look forward you know, towards the forecast, um, as we look towards spring, and on into summer in the, in the bottom set of maps here, you can see warmer conditions um, is what Dr. Art Douglas is forecasting as we look towards, uh, towards the next several months um, throughout the bulk of the country. Uh, in terms of precipitation on the right-hand side, um, generally dry through the spring as well. Um, he is anticipating some decent precipitation up through the upper Midwest, upper Corn Belt regions, um, so in terms of having some adequate moisture to get you know, a crop in the ground up there, um, should be there. But as you roll down into summer, seeing some drier conditions, they're cropping up. Um, but will continue to be you know, something that we'll need to monitor in terms of the feed grain situation. And obviously, looking towards summer precipitation, um, you have the bulk of the western two-thirds of the United States, um, again, continuing to forecast on the drier side of average, in particular uh, through the Great through the Great Plains region. So shifting gears, taking a look at the cattle market landscape. So clearly, we've been in a situation where the limited um, tighter margins, limited profitability, um, have really put the squeeze on the cow calf producer the last couple of years. Um, and we expect that it continued, uh, you know, all signs point that uh, certainly continued in 2020 as well. And so as we look towards um, the cattle inventory report that will be out this Friday, we're anticipating another 1% decline in the beef cow herd into January 1 of this year. And as we look forward, um, it, it's a slow ship to turn, obviously, and some of this uh, this trend in the in the liquidation is baked into the cake, and now as we look, you know, considering the forecast and these drought conditions that we've seen, suggesting that drought may continue to be a factor um, yeah, that should influence this going forward, um, and con continue to suggest uh, that the beef cow herd will likely continue to to slip lower in the next couple of years. Now, fed slaughter. Obviously, following the beef cow herd um, with the lag in terms of the fed cattle supplies. So as we look towards our forecast for 2021, 
you can see that we do have it um, higher than 2020 um, and roughly steady to slightly smaller than 2019. Yeah, and recognizing that a big chunk of this year over year decrease that we saw in 2020 was obviously due to the plant shutdowns um, and the subsequent backlog of cattle, both inside and outside of feed yards that we saw during the spring. And so as we look you know, from a year over year standpoint, you know, a good chunk of that year over year increase um, is what we're seeing today in terms of these large fed cattle supplies stacked up against the first half of the year. And so as we look on into the second half of 2021, we can anticipate you know, that we will start to work into those smaller cattle supplies and those two years of consecutively smaller calf crops that we have behind us will start to show their way through. And so as we compare back to 2019 levels, um, you know, as the best benchmark um, compared when we have these COVID disruptions that we're gonna be comparing against in 2020, essentially larger slaughter during the first half of the year and smaller slaughter during the second half of the year. So as we break this down um, in, in terms of net, uh, net per capita beef supply, so clearly we saw on the previous chart that anticipating a larger fed slaughter in 2021, but, and larger beef production as well. However, you add in an improvement in the balance of trade. Uh, we have beef exports up 5% and imports down five, you know, as, uh, as we'll get into later in this discussion. But the main point is, even though we'll have beef production higher and fed slaughter higher, we're looking at a net beef supply essentially on par with year ago levels. And again, something that will be larger through the first part of the year and smaller in the second half of the year. And as we look forward over the next several years, those continued smaller calf crops will continue to show up in terms of pulling back on that net per capita beef supply. Another factor that we're looking at in the market, uh, it's a pretty significant shift from what we've seen over the last five years, is the competing protein landscape. So we've gotten pretty well trained uh, that over the last several years, we've gotten used to looking at bigger uh, competing meat supplies um, on a year over year basis pretty consistently. Now that ship has turned. The, on, the, on the left side, um, taking a look at pork, you know, during the COVID disruptions, market disruptions this spring, uh, the hog producer pulled back on farrowings. And as a result, we have a smaller pork production, smaller hog slaughter rates, um, pretty well baked into the cake for 2021. And add on top of that continued strong um, pork exports. Um, we've seen some pretty substantial export growth um, to China for this year or for 2020. We're anticipating more modest growth in 2021, but growth nonetheless. And as a result, per capita supplies come down. Similar story on the poultry side of things. Uh, for the first time in quite a few years, actually seeing where, anticipating where these higher grain prices are going to pull back on, uh, pull back on poultry production. And again, add in some export growth. And you see per capita supplies coming down on a year over year basis. So as we back this out to the uh, to beef wholesale values, anticipating a beef cutout that averages uh, roughly 220 for the year. As you look back, more or less on par with where it averaged in 2019. Now, as you look at the year-over-year -year decline in this chart, they're roughly $16 lower than 2020. The real difference there is uh, anticipating you know, you're, you're wiping off those uh, those rockets higher. Uh, that we saw last year when the beef buyer was concerned and panicked about supplies being available and beef, the beef complex uh, shot to the moon. You take those out and we anticipate just continued strong beef demand uh, here in 2021. You know, obviously, again, the, the consumer um, from an end user standpoint, uh, demand has been very well supported. Um, and there's no doubt that that the uh, you know, tremendous amount of stimulus money that's been thrown at 
uh, at the consumer by the government has offset you know, plenty of the economic um, uncertainty. And as a result, the consumer has been able to continue to support the quality and reward the quality that we have in the product. Um, not to mention, you know, as you look at that cooking from home demand, um, you know, the consumer showing that they would prefer to cook beef you know, over the other options when it comes to their protein of choice. Other factors, um, obviously continued strong export demand as we're going to look at uh, here, in a, here in a moment. And then you know, as we progress on through the year, anticipating the return of food service and restaurant business in a larger way. And so compared to the last, you know, roughly the last year, we're gonna add another buyer uh, you know, back to the beef complex. And so that should support values here as well. Another factor that we've seen that we've been pretty well trained towards the last couple of years is we've been in this situation where fed slaughter, fed cattle supplies have exceeded what the packing capacity can process, the packing segment can process on a Monday through Friday basis. So as you look at the blue bars here, indicating what we would consider 40 hour capacity for the packing segment, and compare that to weekly average uh, fed slaughter in the red line, where we've clearly exceeded that for the last several years. And, and um, especially uh, as we all well know in 2020. And as a result, leverage has had to favor the packer, the packing segment to incentivize you know, strong slaughter rates and, and large Saturday slaughters. And as we look forward, you know, uh, we, we certainly know that there's plenty of you know, there's plenty of small and medium sized packing facilities that are going to be coming online and ramping up production at the same time while fed slaughter will begin cyclically contracting. So as a result, um, that leverage component will be in to move and trend, uh, trend in favor of cattle values. So as we roll this all together and take, take a look at prices from a macro standpoint, um, as you see here in front of you, looking at the beef and then fed cattle, feeders, and calves, you can see where we anticipate you know, that year-over-year -year decline in the cutout here this year, but anticipating classes of cattle all moving higher. And then as we look forward, um, you know, the beef continuing to trend higher over time you know, as we have those tighter beef supplies and prices move higher as a result. And not to mention, as we look towards the cattle segments, um, on a per head basis, um, expect that cattle values will gain even relative to that higher cutout as we go through the course of the next several years on those tighter cattle supplies. So as we move this back uh, closer to our 2021 forecast, as I mentioned, that leverage component, um, you know, and the chart here in front of you is looking at the fed price as a percentage of the box beef cutout. And so what we have penciled in is for the uh, for that leverage component to basically average near 2019 levels on the year. Um, leverage struggling it is currently struggling as we're starting into the year with that large place against fed cattle supply you know, that we're up against um, here to start the year. You know, simply that carryover that's persisted all the way from the COVID disruptions. But as we look towards the second half of the year, an improving leverage situation that progresses as we work our way through the year. So as we bring this down to our fed cattle price, anticipating an annual average of roughly 117, more or less on par um, with the past four years. Uh, there, you know, as you take out 2020 and look towards that 2016 to 2019 area. Again, as you look at this, as you break that down seasonally in terms of the expectations, again, fed cattle prices um, starting off the year uh, significantly lower than where we came into the year each of the last two years, as you compare to 2020 and 2019. As we look at, as we look towards, uh, as we look towards spring, anticipating that we will see that normal seasonal response uh, with cattle prices moving higher into a spring high. 
<clears throat> if you want to anticipate something roughly in that lower 20s area here today um, would be our expectation and recognizing that there is potential more upside uh, you know, depending uh, depending on a number of things, how fast we move through the front end supply, and if the cattle segment's able to gain leverage quicker than we anticipate, or also um, you know, the potential for um, for a futures led led movement higher into a spring high, um, as the market starts to look towards tighter cattle supplies in the second half of the year, and on towards you know and over the next several years. And as we roll through summer, should find very strong support in this lower teens market um, and potential that we don't get that cheap as well. Um, you know, certainly as you look at June and August live cattle today, sitting there in that 18 to 19 area, um, you know, it does suggest that the market is anticipating something better um, than even where we're at here today for a summer market. And then as we get towards the second, get deeper into the year, um, you often get into this situation at this point in the cattle cycle where we're moving into tighter fed cattle supplies. Your fourth quarter highs can take out those spring highs. And so if you put a high in the low, in the low 20s this spring, a high in that 25 to 30 range uh, for the fourth quarter is certainly not out of question as you see those fourth quarter highs um, taking out our spring highs. As we shift gears to feeder cattle, um, certainly where you're seeing plenty of the impact of higher corn, higher cost of gains working their way through. Um, you know, certainly right here as we're starting the year, we're in that typical slow season, slow spot um, you know, where feeders do tend to put in their annual low for the year in the first three or four months of the year. And so no surprise that you know, basis the CME feeder cattle index an 800 pound central plains steer, basically sitting there at a mid 130s market. But as we look you know, deeper into the year, um, you know, we think that while feeders should be pretty well supported you know, in this area here in the near term, should be moving higher um, following that typical seasonal pattern as you look at the gray seasonal index into that August, September, October timeframe, late summer to early fall. Now, for those of you that may have read our long-term outlook that we published um, in early December, we anticipated a high going up to the 160 mark. Now, and that was, that was roughly a dollar ago in the corn market. So considering those changes, um, you know, some rough math here does suggest that you know, a few ways that we could get there and how that would impact you know, our potential forecast. So, you know, Cost of gains have obviously moved higher, but at the same time, um, you know, it's been partially offset by a move higher in the deferred live cattle futures, where high corn equals higher cattle prices. And you see where the function of the market will be to continue to, uh, to prop up and support the deferred live cattle at levels, at levels that are above cost of gains to continue to incentivize cattle to be placed on feed. And so as a result, we've seen um, some of this, this hit in terms of cost of gains be offset by higher live cattle futures. So as we look towards that 160 mark, you know, say we do see corn continue to move higher and you push cost of gains up to $1.15. If we have the February and April of 2022 live cattle sitting at a $25 to $30 range, it'll be hard to get feeders to that 160 forecast that we had penciled in coming into the year. But recognize that both the corn and cost of gain or the live cattle side of things, either of these levers can move. If you push, if you bring, keep cost of gains at this dollar five area, uh, say that's roughly where we're at today. If you keep cost of gains in that area and a 20, 25 to $30 live cattle futures, could still get you to 160. Or if cost of gains do move higher, corn moves higher, but if you see live cattle, you know, adding one more layer, getting to that 130 to 35 area, that could also get you to that 160 mark. So a couple of factors to be watching you know, as we try to continue to hone expectations for that late summer, early fall feeder market. 
In terms of CAPS, um, our annual calf price forecast, um, based on the US average 550 pound steer, um, we're calling an annual average at 168 this year, roughly $10 higher than what we saw in 2020, and you know, roughly $4 higher uh, than 2019. So as you look at the chart, you know, again, feeder prices have, or calf prices have been more or less range bound you know, for the last 45 to 60 days. But as we look towards, uh, as we look towards spring, prices will begin to move higher um, as that grass demand, as that turnout demand uh, begins, to, begins to ramp up. But clearly, this is something that, you know, as we look at these drought conditions, and these higher costs of gains from higher feed co feed costs will be a limiting factor. It could very well be a limiting factor to this spring rally. So again, our LTO forecast, our long-term outlook was for 180 high for calf prices. We may not get there, uh, depending on how how you know, the drought plays out, um, turnout demand, and, and as well as feed stuffs. So we may need to moderate our expectations somewhat there, but nonetheless prices should still move seasonally higher. Now, as we look out towards the fall run and try to hone our expectations for you know, what this year's calf crop will be worth, um, more significantly, as you look at the range for our forecasts, we moved up the bottom end uh, to roughly 160, you know, uh, roughly $15 higher than last year, roughly $10 higher um, than the post, uh, post Tyson Holcomb plant lows that we saw in the fall of 2019. So as we simply look and think back towards you know, the fact that these calves that will be hitting the ground this spring will be the third consecutive year of smaller calf crops. So certainly you know, the market will be looking towards tighter calf supplies as we look towards the fall run. And so should support calf prices you know, certainly higher than what we've seen the last two years and should keep a pretty strong floor in that low 60s area. So to summarize this part of the discussion, um, you know, as we look across the, across the cattle market landscape, you know, clearly feedstuffs, feed costs, and drought um, will be the biggest threats you know, as we look towards 2021. And you know, the most important things to try to manage, to try to manage around um, for the year. Now, cyclically, cattle producers have responded and pulled back on their in cattle inventories, their cow herds, in response to these lower prices that we've seen over the last several years. You know, not to mention just these extreme levels of volatility and uncertainty you know, that we've been hit with as an industry over the last 18 months. And so, as a result, you know, the cow herd is liquidated. Um, and certainly expecting that drought will continue to be a factor as we look towards you know, what we do as an industry in 2021. But as a result, tighter cattle supplies are coming and, are, and will begin to work through the pipeline. And we certainly expect that those will begin to be realized as we get towards the second half of this year. As we look at the, the demand side of the equation, uh, beef demand, uh, nothing short of resilient this year. And you know, considering the, the unprecedented amount of disruption and uncertainty that we've seen this year, the consumer has continued to suggest that, that they want to buy beef and they've continued to reward quality uh, from a retail standpoint um, and have continued to support values there and move beef through the pipeline. Exports have also continued to remain strong. And then as we look on down the road, again, we do expect that food service and, and restaurant demand will begin to shine through and, you know, and, and could be shining through today you know, with the support that we've seen to the beef complex here recently. You know, as we see, you know, as we look towards a broader reopening of the economy and broader vaccine distribution. And then lastly, you know, in terms of the price outlook, uh, these large fed cattle supplies that we're looking at um, towards the first half of the year, will likely continue to restrain the market near term. Um, and, and that drought, um, drought could continue to be a factor in terms of um, you know, the limitations on the outside cattle 
here in the near term as well. But nonetheless, as we look towards you know, the second half of the year and beyond, um, those tighter supplies you know, should continue to suggest that the price trend will be higher. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass the baton uh, to Tanner Aheron to walk you through the second part of tonight's discussion. Tanner? All right. Thanks. Thank you, Patrick. I'm going to go ahead and get things set up here. Um, before we get started, if you have any questions, be sure to uh, enter those in the chat box. Uh, we'll try to we'll save a few minutes at the end to uh, try and answer all those. Um, I'm going to walk you through the global uh, segment of this presentation. And we're actually getting this content and these slides from U.S. Meat Export Federation. Dan Hallstrom, the CEO of USMEF, presented uh, this content in our recent Outlook and Strategy seminar. And unfortunately, with his busy schedule, he wasn't able to join us this evening. Um, but we still thought that this material was very important, very unique, and provided a uh, deeper dive into you know, the export markets and why beef exports are so important to our markets. Um, so I'm going to hit the highlights and paraphrase with what he said in our recent seminar. But first off, for those of you that aren't familiar with the USMEF, they're a nonprofit organization based out of Denver, Colorado, um, but they also have offices and staff located all over the globe, and that's paid uh, pretty big dividends here lately with the travel restrictions. They haven't missed a beat, been uh, charging right along with their jobs. Uh, but their main goal is to promote U.S. beef around the world, um, educate consumers, retailers, everyone invo involved in the meat sales and the supply chain around the world. But to start things off, um, we're going to take a step back and look at where we stood entering 2020. And we started the year off with some really strong momentum before COVID hit. We had some very valuable trade agreements that we had agreed upon with several different countries. And the first one being with Japan. Um, Dan stated that he thought this was actually probably the best ever trade agreement for the beef industry, and if not the best ever, at least since BSE. Japan's our largest value market, um, selling over $2 billion worth of product, and globally we sell about $8 billion. It, the reason it was so important is it leveled the playing field between us and our competitors. Uh, for a couple years, we had been at a duty disadvantage because we did not enter into the TPP agreement. You know, for example, in 2019, we were at a 13% disadvantage to our competitors, especially you know our main competitor, that being Australia. Another deal that was pretty big here entering 2020 um, was with the EU deal. We got a zero duty agreement, and more importantly, the U.S. was allocated our own quota. In past years, we had shared a quota with other countries, and oftentimes they would fill that quota before we were really able to move a lot of product to the EU. And a lot of that product going to the EU is some of your, your program product or your value added programs, the cattle that go through those different programs. And then another one is China agreeing to that phase one deal. Um, you know, great opportunities. We're starting to see uh, some of that show up now, but I think the best is yet to come from that standpoint. And then lastly, the USMCA, um, really no major changes on that agreement, other than uh, we kept the, you know, we kept the duty, zero duty the same that we had with NAFTA. Um, but more importantly, the big reason why it was a big deal to, uh, get that finalized is it gave the supply chain and the markets the stability and eliminated, eliminated any uncertainty out there as far as you know the North American trade goes. As we figured out in the last eight to 12 months, markets do not like uncertainty. Um, and it's important that we keep a good trade agreement with Canada and Mexico because they're big buyers of end meats, especially when it comes to sending rounds to Mexico. So as we uh, went through 2020, obviously, a lot of this was overshadowed with the COVID-19 news, um, but we still had all these agreements in place as we enter 2021. 
We're going to touch on some individual countries, starting off with Japan, as I mentioned, the highest value market that we have. And this slide represents the program or chilled business in Korea. And the definition of chilled is it's never frozen from the time that it leaves the plant to the time that it's bought by a consumer or served at a restaurant. You know, at the lowest it ever gets is about 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And the main reason, you know, the main goal of this is to maximize the chilled market in Japan. And the reason why you want to maximize the chilled market um, around the globe is because the chilled market, chilled business, is a 52-week per year business. It's more of a hand-to-mouth business. If you think about some of your frozen products uh, and how that market works, you can do a lot more speculating in that. You can wait for the market to hit a low and buy a bunch of product and then sit out when the market's at its highs. Um, so basically, in the, in the chilled products, price is inelastic. It essentially doesn't matter. They continue to procure product each week. And you'll notice the charts are showing the market share battle between uh, four different countries, with the main two being Australia and the U.S. And from 2017 to 2018, um, we started to narrow that market share, mostly due to that 13% duty disadvantage that we had. And as we went to 2018, U.S. only had about a 3% market share advantage. If we had 2019 on this chart, it would have been less than 1%. Um, 2020, once we get the final numbers, it looks like we're on pace to have about a 4% market share advantage over all Australia and would expect to see that to continue to um, further or going forward from here. So that's a pretty big deal to, to gain market share um, in Japan. Here's an example of the online campaign that USMES uh, MEF did through social media with some of the national retailers. Essentially how it worked is basically every X amount of beef that they purchased, they were entered into a, this promotion or campaign. Uh, they anticipated to get about 1 million entries in the two months they did it from July to August. And then the actual number of entries that they got was 12 million. Pretty impressive number uh, relative to their expectations. Just proves that uh, the consumers over in Japan are, are hungry for the U.S. beef and its unmatched quality that we produce here domestically. As we take a closer look at Japan, in particular the retail segments over there, uh, they break it down into national and regional retailers. Uh, the national retailers have really been the cornerstone for U.S. beef. Uh, we send a lot of product to the, the bigger retailers. Uh, I'm not going to list those names you can see there in the top bullet um, but that's very strong high demand for u.s product within those bigger retailers on the other side of the re regional retailers the regional chains um, we don't have a lot of u.s product within those those stores um, or didn't to start off 2020. a lot of times they're supplied domestically by domestic producers or processors or by our competitors Canada or Australia. But in the last 12 months, uh, the U.S. product has really gained a lot of traction there. A lot of it has to do with COVID. Uh, we've leveled the playing field out with the duty, duty free or the taking us back to the, the same duty as our other competitors. And then at the same time, while Australia has been rebuilding their herd, they can't find the supply down under that they need. And so uh, as we think about uh, Japan over the next few years, we'd expect to see uh, the regionals really carry the weight and uh, really see a lot more product within those stores. Another main market that is a close second to Japan that makes up about 1.7 to 1.8 billion in sales is Korea. Um, and we, they started to notice a transition before COVID, um, a strong demand for convenience. And a lot of that has to do with the demographics within Korea. They have a lot of one and two income houses, households or professionals with no kids. And those people have a lot of spending power. They have a lot of money that they wanna spend on quality and services. And at the same time, they also have an aging population which has a strong desire for convenience. Um, so in the trend for one and two income households pre-COVID was expected to increase 70% over the next four years. And then you add in COVID, it only uh, accelerates you know, the fact that people uh, wanna continue to spend more money on convenience. And this chart is uh, 
showing that Korea is expected to have the biggest growth in e-commerce sales uh, for food drinks from 2019 to 2024, according to Euromonitor. Obviously, U.S. is pretty close there, sitting at 116% increase. Um, but aside from that, South Korea is, has a big advantage or big expectations on a percentage basis relative to the other countries listed on here. And the reason why uh, e-commerce is so important to uh, the beef industry and the beef market is it's because it's led to an emergence of fresh or chilled product that I mentioned earlier. You know, Korea is forecasted to account for about 12% of all global food and drink e-commerce sales by the end of the year. And they have the infrastructure and 24 hour um, delivery abilities that's really important for fresh products. And Korea is an important market or Asian market because they consume a lot of beef. You know, for example, in 2019, they consumed about 35 pounds per person. This is compared to Japan that consumed about 23 pounds per person. In Taiwan, they consumed about 17 pounds per person. As we think about Korea's chilled beef imports with US and the, the dark blue bar there, you know, we've really taken off since 2015. Um, and in 2017, we took over the top spot as far as market share goes versus Australia. In 2020, we're on pace once we get the final numbers to set a record for market share as well. So made some really big improvements on a quick basis. And the main reason for making big strides really quickly goes back to Costco. You can't talk about Korea without mentioning Costco. Costco has about 680 stores across the world with about 11 or 12 of those stores in Korea. And in fact, two of the the highest grossing meat counters are in the, the borders of Korea. The number one and the number three ranking meat counters are in Korea. So there's huge meat, or, meat eaters, as I mentioned before. And the big reason is in 2016, the U.S. had about a 10% market share in Costco, Korea. And then in 2019, they committed to 100% U.S. product, uh, which really moved the needle in a big way. Now, I talked about how important China was, the phase one deal that we got uh, done uh, to start off 2020. And you'll notice that we're starting to make improvements as we look at 19 and just through the first eight months of 2020 and the chart above. And looking back over time after BSE, we really didn't gain any access until about 2017. And even at that time period, we still had some restrictions such as NHTC or non-hormone treated products. Um, but the phase one deal was significant and honestly, probably about the second most important deal we've had in a long time. Um, we've seen a, they've seen a big increase in plant registrations to send product to China going from 70 to over 500 plants. So it was, uh, you know, some of the major wins within that that deal where the no traceability removed the NHT restri NHTC restriction and now have uh, access for product that comes from animals over 30 months of age. Now we still do have the ractopamine free uh, restrictions in there, um, but it is, uh, you know, does have a risk assessment being conducted currently. So great results so far. Uh, just an example in November, we exported about 24 million pounds to China. Um, that compares in November of 2020, and in November of 2019, we exported less than 4 million pounds. So pretty big improvements. As we touch on the uh, Mexico and Central America um, markets briefly, when you think about e-commerce, these regions are on the lower end of the charts, kind of the opposite side of the spectrum compared to Korea. However, with COVID, we're starting to jumpstart that e-commerce and a lot of the online platforms and would expect that to become a, become a norm, more normal process post-COVID. Um, USMEF has uh, taken the initiative um, to create virtual platforms uh, for consumers, to consult with chefs and nutritionists 
um, do this online, whereas before they were doing it at the point of sale or at the, you know, the retail stores, et cetera. The last region we're gonna to touch on is Africa. Um, the blue areas represent where USMEF is working for the last four or five years. Uh, the red is where they're targeting. A big trade deal that is currently being negotiated is a free trade agreement with Kenya. Um, and the reason why that's important is because it, uh, right now Europe has a strong presence in that area as far as science and production and ag practices go there. Uh, but this would give the U.S. A, a great opportunity to promote its product there and really uh, show how the U.S. Uh, produces a safe, wholesome product. Another thing to touch on is that Africa is the second largest destination for variety meats um, just behind the Middle East. And we think when we think about price discovery, competition is good. It's uh, encouraging to have two main buyers competing for one product. Um, through September, through last September, beef variety meat exports to Africa were up over 60%. So pretty impressive. Um, it's a key destination when it comes to variety meats. Now the final slide here that I'm gonna to touch on, probably the most important, looking at USMEF's export forecast. Um, the 2020, we'll get the official December numbers here shortly, but probably gonna see uh, uh, a decline, year over year decline, mostly due to COVID disruptions through the spring and summer. But as we think about 2021, do anticipate a strong, robust demand, um, and it's gonna be broad based across to all those countries. Canada on this list is the only one that USMEF has ex um, forecast to see a year over year decline. You know, continue to see strong movement to our main players of Japan and Korea, and then you've got China. Expect to see a large year over year growth of 28%. When you roll up all those countries, USMEF is a little bit more optimistic than cattle facts right now. Uh, but they certainly have some valid reasons with the content that we just went over. Uh, they have exports forecast to grow 10% in 2021. Another important comment on this slide is taking this back to the Fed market and how important exports are to the cattle markets. In 2020, they estimated that exports accounted for about $300 per head per fed animal. In 2021, they anticipate that to increase about $30 a head. So it's just reiterating how important it is that we have access to all these countries um, and continue to promote our, our beef around the world. So lastly, just to summarize, you know, we started off 2020 uh, with a strong tailwind, a lot of momentum. All those agreements are still in place um, as we start 2021, which are big positives for the U.S. Uh, beef industry. You know, COVID did bring some challenges, but at the same time, it created a lot of opportunities. And U.S. beef demand around the world is still strong and would expect it to continue to grow even more going forward. So we want to thank USMEF for allowing us to borrow these slides. Um, we're going to switch things up a little bit. And Dr. Brett Terhar from Alanco Animal Health is going to uh, go through some of their different vaccines. And once again, we appreciate their sponsorship um, that they've had for several years now and appreciate Dr. Terhar taking some time out of his evening to, to join us. So Dr. Terhar, it's uh, all yours now. Okay, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay, great. Thanks, Patrick and Tanner. Uh, those comments are always uh, timely and um, it's good to look forward to, to some uh, positive things um, this year. So as Tanner said, my name is Brett Terhar. I'm a technical consultant with uh, Lanco Animal Health, a veterinarian by training. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about how to get your calves off to a good start this spring. Um, many of you, of you are likely familiar with Alanco and our line of antibiotics and plant feed additives. For years, American farmers and ranchers have, have looked towards Alanco for brands like Mycotil, uh, Romance in Thailand, and others to control cattle disease, improve performance and production. Many of you may be less aware of the 
Alanco vaccine line. Over uh, the last few years, Alanco has added um, equally trusted vaccines to their portfolio. Uh, products like Scourboss, Virushield, Titanium, and Nuplura. So our aim at Alanco is to provide safe and effective and innovative solutions for cattle producers at all stages of production. Um, from the cow calf to the, the finished um, animal in the feedlot. So we know that um, for cow calf producers, um, we're looking at the spring calving season and getting calves off to a good start is, is important. Um, if some of you may have started calving already, and if not, it'll be happening real soon. So it's a great time to talk about calf vaccination and, and getting those calves, start, calves started off right um, by starting with a vaccine program, calves will be prepared to handle the stress that comes later in their lives, that, that weaning, shipping, and commingling that can come later. So we want to give a vaccine that is long-lasting and protection and able to get them through those high-risk periods. When it comes to vaccines, at Alanco, we talk about immunity for life. We emphasize people using the right product with the right protection at the right time. Uh, we want to get cattle vaccinated to deliver um, the right prevention at the right time so they're protected ahead of challenges that they're going to face down the road. So there's a lot of options out there and, and sometimes there's confusion around what, um, what to use. Really, for, for the cow-calf uh, sector, bovine respiratory disease is a is probably the biggest concern so when selecting a vaccine we want to keep that in mind when we're talking about vaccinating calves this young this uh, young calves this spring um, you know calves under stress can quickly develop respiratory disease and uh, and so that's a that's a big deal it's one of the costliest diseases to the industry um, and if even if calves don't die from it, which they can, we see poor performance in uh, lower gains down the road uh, for any calves that have been sick. So it's important to understand some of the leading uh, causes of BRD, bovine respiratory disease. And, and the biggest player is Mannheimia hemolytica. It's in about three quarters of the diagnosed cases of respiratory disease. You may be familiar with Mannheimia, Mannheimia hemolytica uh, as being Pastorella hemolytica years ago. Um, so the new name is, the newer name is Mannheimia hemolytica. Um, and one of the vaccines that is a great choice that, that we have at Alanco is, is Nuplura pH. It's a great choice for protecting calves against Mannheimia hemolytica. It's safe for calves as young as 28 days. It delivers the fastest immunity on the market. Uh, all our work and when we uh, do our um, investigative work on licensing this product, we see protection uh, just 10 days after vaccination. It's, it's also known for being really easy on cattle. Uh, and that's a big deal when you've got when you're vaccinating calves this spring. Um, no one likes to see calves that go through a sweat or look poor after vaccination. And one of the things that we hear over and over again is Nuplura is really easy on cattle. It, it's it is unique because it's made with a, a unique uh, recombinant technology. So um, one of the newest Mannheimia vaccines on the on the market, and that unique a method of manufacture re manufacturing reduces the amount of endotoxins. Those are the things that make cattle look bad after vaccination. This product has a super low level of endotoxins because of the way it's manufactured. So not so you get something that's safe but gives quick and strong protection. Um, you know another thing that that people talk about or we get questions about is um, what about using intranasal vaccines in young calves? Um, one of my first comments is, um, if the calves are getting colostrum, 
like they should within the first 12 hours, I, I would be somewhat, I am somewhat hesitant to be in a big rush to get a vaccine into those calves. Every time we put uh, a vaccine up the nose or under the skin, those calves have to deal with it. And when they're dealing with the vaccine and, and it turns off, turns on their immune system, and because they have to make antibodies and all that, they are um, taking energy and protein and making antibodies and, and dealing with the vaccine instead of growing or maybe just keeping warm if, it, if it's a really rough spring. So that's, that's probably the first thing is, hey, don't get in a big rush to get vaccine into calves when they're two, three, four days old or even three weeks old. Give them some time. Um, you know, back to intranasals, it looks like they're they're more convenient because you're avoiding needles. Um, but the other thing that's important there is if uh, if you're applying or giving the cattle intranasal vaccines, you really need to be careful to change those cannulas, the the little plastic piece uh, between each calf when you're vaccinating because that is a super duper good way of, of spreading disease from nose to nose and getting into a problem. Um, probably more important, you know, another thing is just some of the short protection window we see with the intranasal vaccines. Um, really, um, the uh, other thing that is, is uh, lacking there in those intranasal vaccines is BVD protection. And so, um, none of the intranasal vaccines have BVD, and that is a super important uh, virus to be concerned about. And so, when when you're when you're looking at that, you may want to look at um, a vaccine that has BVD in it, which would be an injectable, or a product um, that would fill in the gaps for an intranasal vaccine program. So, uh, certainly, you want to talk to your veterinarian about the best vaccine for your operation. Um, we would like to thank uh, all those at CattleFax for uh, um, putting on a really informative evening for all of us. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you, Alanco Animal Health. Um, all of us there at Alanco Animal Health are dedicated to bringing a full set of herd health um, solutions to many producers needs so i wanted i want to encourage anyone looking for more information on vaccination to contact their herd health veterinarian or their alanco representative or you could even visit uh, a website nuplura.com n-u-p-l-u-r-a.com and find more information uh, about um, some exciting advances we have coming this spring with with that with that product uh, with that, Tanner, I believe I'll turn it back to you. All right. Thanks, Dr. Terhar. And once again, I want to thank Alanco for sponsoring this webinar to make it free for everyone. Uh, before we get to questions and give everyone a little bit of time to type in any last minute questions, um, do have some last minute uh, announcements, I guess, to make. We are currently conducting our annual cow calf survey uh, where we collect data from the prior year and use this as uh, you know to measure some of the different production data around the industry and help us uh, going forward. Um, to find this survey, go to cattlefacts.com, click on the About tab at the top of the page, and on the left-hand side, you'll see the 2020 Cow-Calf Survey link. Um, those who participate and submit a valid email address will receive a results summary packet that you can use to benchmark against your, uh, your own operation. And then you can see below we do we will continue this Trends Plus series uh, with one at the end of May and then one the first of September. So we do have a few questions here. Uh, the first one: What kind of impact um, will the continued increase in dairy beef cross calves have on market dynamics? Um, I think the simple answer is no major impacts. Um, we're not necessarily adding more animals to the, uh, the fed supply or decreasing any animals. We're just kind of changing up the genetic makeup of that sample. 
I think one thing that we will start to notice is that the turnover rate will be a lot higher. You know, you won't be feeding the, the dairy cattle or the Holstein cattle for, you know, a really long time on feed. Uh, with the beef influence, you should start to see uh, your performance improve, faster gains, um, and as a result, quicker turnover rates within the feed yard. Patrick, I'm gonna let you answer this next one since you talked about the weather. Is there a prediction on how long the drought will continue? Will it last into the fall of 2021 or beyond? Yeah, you know, there's, you know, obviously with weather, there's always a wider range of forecasts. And there are some out there that are beginning to question if this La Nina pattern uh, that's causing these dry conditions will start to end, you know, in the you know first half of the year. Um, Dr. Art Douglas, who we use for our forecasting, um, he sees the La Nina continuing likely through the fall, um, and and so he is anticipating that at least you know, through that time frame, um, drier than normal conditions will more than likely persist. And just another kind of thought on this, you know, some tend to see that the La Nina El Nino cycles follow roughly a 10-year pattern. And so that doesn't mean that we're going to fall, have uh, five years of, um, of La Nina, but uh, it does suggest that maybe we'll be on the average side to drier than average, you know, at least here for the near term. All right, we, we got time for one more question. Um, thoughts on fed cattle basis for 2021. Will it continue to be negative for the rest of the year? Um, that is a great question. It's definitely been a challenge that uh, cattle feeders have dealt with really since last summer. And once you get into a weak basis pattern, it's really tough to get that to flip. Uh, you know, you've, a lot of it has to do with the poor leverage situation that we're in right now. Um, and at the same time, it has to do with what Patrick went over with the tighter supplies on down the road. And that's why we've built such a premium in the back end of the live cattle futures. Um, so with that said, I think it has you know a lot to do with when will we start to see the leverage really change or when will that uh, start to work more towards the cattle feeder um, and at the same time, that'll probably happen when we get into a better supply situation as well. But once you uh, start a weak basis pattern, it's really, really tough to uh, get out of that. And basis is, uh, you know, and the situation we're going through right now is, is pretty difficult to predict. Um, so that's just some thoughts and comments on, on that topic. Looks like we're getting short on time. Um, I know we've got a few questions here that we weren't able to answer. We'll uh, send you an email tomorrow, reply to or give you a response. If you have any fo follow-up questions later, uh, don't be afraid to send myself or Patrick an email, or if you have any questions um, for Lanco or Dr. Terhar, you can send us an email as well and, and we'll uh, forward those on. Uh, there will be a recording of this webinar for you to reference later on. Um, and with that, uh, greatly appreciate everyone taking some time out of their evenings to join us um, and look forward to you guys joining us next time. Thanks, have a great evening.